Gospel Tangents is supported by users like you. Please support us at gospeltangents.com or on Patreon. Best source for Mormon history, science, and theology and first daily Mormon history podcast. I'm Rick Bennett. In our final conversation with Dr. Val Larson, we're going to talk about uh, his conclusion that theosis actually is in the Book of Mormon. Of course, Mormons call this exaltation. So we'll uh, also talk about what other projects he's working on. So you won't want to miss this conversation. Check it out. Now, I'm, I'm going to go on to a shorter description now of the of probably what is the most explicit uh, theosis story in in the scriptures. So let's finish with a final, and in many respects, the best example of theosis in the Book of Mormon, the second Nephi, the second person named Nephi. The discussion here is, is, is shorter. Um, the, it's, it's all pretty explicit. Uh, this Nephi provides the clearest example of theosis in Scripture. He becomes the chief judge of the death of his father, Helaman, and in that purely human role, he's not a success. Almost all the Nephite lands are lost during his judgeship, and then only half of the, what's lost is regained. He's, he's the main politician. He's the head of state. Few politicians could survive as a leader in the wake of a military collapse of that magnitude. Unsurprisingly, this second Nephi loses his position as chief judge. The text blames the people for this loss. The Book of Mormon is, among many other things, a sympathetic history of Alma family rule. I've got a whole theory about that, that the Book of Mormon is a handbook, a governance handbook for the Alma family that got repurposed at the very end. Hmm. And, um, and I'm going to have that written up at some point. But, um, but one, one of the things it does is it never frames the Alma family as doing anything wrong. I mean, it, it does initially, when they go, when they uh, deviate from Christ, and it shows uh, it, uh, that's that's the key part of the handbook. Don't ever turn away from Christ because it doesn't matter how much talent, success you have, you're you're a disaster unless you have Christ. But 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 that the, the book that actually uh, illuminates the book a lot to think of it that way. But uh, but anyway, uh, even though the Book of Mormon is is letting Nephi off the hook here. The people wouldn't have, you know, you don't get to lose half your country as the head of state. It's it's very unlikely that his resignation was voluntary. Uh, other uh, the other political party, we see them take over, and uh, this you you lost you lost half our country. All right, goodbye. No longer the chief judge, Nephi takes it upon himself to preach the word of God all the remainder of his days. Uh, we get the great story of about uh, Nephi and Lehi in the same prison where Abinadi was imprisoned having experiences like Abinadi that are described in words that echo Abinadi's story. Uh, Nephi and Lehi are transformed into beings of light, like Abinadi was, and all, uh, and all the people they minister to become members of the Divine Council. If listeners want to know the details, they can read them in a, a 2023 interpreter article that uh, Newell and I did, uh, wrote, Theosis in the Book of Mormon. Not Newell with- Bringhurst. What's that? Not Noel Bringhurst. Uh, yeah, Noel Wright. Noel Wright and okay. I. Yeah, my co-author. Yeah. Um, uh, so let's move on to the apotheosis of Nephi, who has given all God's power to move within and affect the world. The predicate for this conferral of power is the alignment of Nephi's mind with the mind of God. God speaks to Nephi using the same words Lamoni used when he equated his wife with divine beings. Blessed art thou. That's what he says to his wife after he uh, comes up and have, has that vision. So here's the quote, blessed art thou, Nephi, for those things which thou hast done, for I have beheld how thou hast with unweariness declared the word. And now because thou hast done this with such unweariness, behold, I will bless thee forever and I will make thee mighty in word and deed and faith and in works. Yea, even that all things shall be done unto thee according to thy word, for thou shalt not ask that which is contrary to my will. Behold, I am God. Behold, I declare unto thee in the presence of mine angels that ye shall have power over this people. Behold, I give you power that whatsoever ye shall seal on earth shall be sealed in heaven, whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Thus saith the Lord God who is almighty. At this point in his life, Nephi, like Christ, becomes an incarnation of God on the earth. Uh, I'm, I'm, that's... I know that's an odd way of speaking, but I, I think it's true. He's an incarnation of God. Hmm. He has all God's power uh, given to him. As he would be the first to insist, he didn't live 
a perfect life like the Savior. Unlike the Savior, he wasn't born as an incarnation of God, but through the grace and power of Christ's atonement, he has become one with the Savior and one with God. He has become what Christ commands all of us to become perfect, even as our Father in heaven is perfect. He's a full-fledged member of the divine council, and by all that but the most abstract philosophical standards is a God. Like the first Nephi during his vision, he knows what only God can know. Like the first Nephi, he moves from place to place instantaneously as only a god could move. Unsurprisingly, as was true for Ammon, some of the people declare more in truth than in error, quote, behold, he is a god. That's them confounding a man and a god again, right? This is right in the Book of Mormon, a man who becomes indistinguishable from a god with all the powers of god. And so uh, and, uh, the other things I've, uh, I've read symbolically and bringing symbols together to, to make explicit the the uh, theosis that's happening there. And I think it's powerful. I think it's very cogent. Uh, and symbolically, uh, it actually is, is in, in a way, telling a deeper truth than this narrative is. But this is the narrative where it's made fully explicit. That Nephi is given all God says. You ha- anything that you say happen can happen. Uh, you have my power uh, and uh, divine powers. And then the people start calling him a god. Uh, Nephi's dual citizenship on earth and in heaven, but primarily in heaven, is signified like that of Alma the Younger by the last thing we're told about him. His death was not witnessed or recorded. All we know is that he departed out of the land of Zarahemlin, whither he went, no man knoweth. We are left to infer that perhaps like Moses, this Nephi was buried by God, or that like Elijah, without dying, he passed into from earth to heaven. Uh, these ambiguities... Uh, in how he passed, separate him from ordinary mortals, again, positioning him between earth and heaven or just in heaven. Taken together with the account we have of his receipt of divine power, this Nephi becomes our best scriptural example of how a, how mortal man receiveth all that my father hath, therefore all that my father hath is given unto him. He has become a perfected son of God like his master and exemplar Christ and has thus become a divine being or a, a, another incarnation of God in the world. So let's wrap things up here. I'm sure your, your audience has had way more than enough of me. Um, <laughs> uh, while some scholars have suggested that theosis is a Nauvoo addition to Restoration Theology, evidence suggests that it was present in the Book of Mormon long before the Nauvoo period. The fact that theosis is independently articulated in the Book of Mormon and the King Follett Discourse is evidence that the doctrine is an integral part of the gospel. There's no reason to believe Joseph saw theosis in the Book of Mormon when he translated the book or or that he developed his understanding of theosis from reading the Book of Mormon. Our ability to see it there, apart from this Nephi story, I I would say, is a function of insightful modern scholarship and voices speaking from the dust at Ugarit and other places that have given us an understanding of what was happening in Lehi's Jerusalem that Joseph couldn't have had. So the two articulations of the doctrine are independent, and our understanding of theosis is made richer by these related but distinct articulations. In his King Follett sermon, Joseph clarified aspects of theosis that are not fully explicit in the Book of Mormon. Joseph's pronouncements about the ontology of God and man are particularly forceful and clear. What he clearly states is only implied in the Book of Mormon. Conversely, some elements of theosis theology are developed with greater clarity in the Book of Mormon than in Joseph's deservedly famous sermon. For example, the close coupling of the mother and son as they play their linked role in salvation is especially clear in the Book of Mormon. Likewise, especially clear is the desire of the father to feature the two most salient objects of his love, the mother and the son, who are the two most important gifts Uh, that come to us uh, as humanity. We return to the Father, the Book of Mormon suggests, by coming to the mother and son, the tree of life and its fruit. That concludes my substantive analysis of theosis in the Book of Mormon, but let me say a thing or two about my sources. The first article that set me on the path to this analysis was Dan Peterson's Nephi and his Asherah, which uh, Rosalind also mentioned as something she was familiar with. Uh. That led me to Kevin Christensen, who uh, open, whose, whose own contributions are significant, but whose biggest contribution was 
to bring Margaret Barker, the great Methodist scholar, to the attention of Latter-day Saint community. Margaret's voluminous work on the Old Testament converges with LDS theology on a remarkable number of dimensions. Have you ever interviewed her? Probably no. You need to get me her email address. <laughs> get a hold of uh, get a hold of Kevin Kevin Christensen, who's on the interpreter board, because because he's he's pretty good friends with her. Okay. Actually, uh, talk, talk when you interviewed Dave, uh, talk with him about it because he's been in touch with her too. Okay. Uh, she she's I think she's read those books of uh, Dave's. I think she liked those books of Dave's uh, oh. and some of what he was doing. I'll be talking to him in the next week or two. Right. Um, uh, Margaret especially highlights the temple and the divine mother. Uh, other on heavenly mother in the Old Testament, I found uh, two books particularly valuable. Uh, Devers, did God have a wife? The answer yeah, is William yes. Dever, he, I love him. He's amazing. And uh, Raphael Patai's The Hebrew Goddess. Uh, my broad outline of the Abrahamic religion is pretty uncontroversial. In my articles, I cite a number of biblical scholars who support various claims I make. Of course, none of them agree with with my analysis uh, or each other uh, in every detail, but given the thinness of the evidence, our uh, reasoning is is based on. So we don't have that much from the Old Testament time. It's not surprising that there's some degrees of disagreement. It's actually, but but on this point about the uh, the divine council as the older theology of Abraham, that's really not a controversial point at all among the secular Old Testament scholars. But let me finish up by mentioning uh, Dave Butler again. <laughs> uh, Dave makes a very important point. He has said that if the Old Testament scholars were to suddenly believe the Book of Mormon is what it says it is, a reliable, detailed, ancient manuscript from the time of Josiah, they would trample each other to death in their rush to get a copy. And having read the book, they would significantly revise their understanding of the Old Testament. Among other things, they would get on board with Margaret Barker's work because like the Book of Mormon, Margaret sees the Old Testament, Yahweh as Christ, and they would shift from a purely evolutionary model of sacred history to a dispensational model in which God reveals his truth at various points in history only to have the people turn away from it. Uh, human understanding of God in the wake of these restoration often evolves, and that's what I was arguing with the Abinadi point, uh, sometimes towards deeper understanding, uh, uh, within, as with Abinadi, or, or after Abinadi, but more often toward heresy and the loss of truth. The bottom line is that if the Book of Mormon is what it claims to, to be, evidence about Old Testament times is much less thin for Latter-day Saint scholars than it is for those who don't have the Book of Mormon. As I've argued in this presentation, the Book of Mormon fits in very well with what scholars tell us was going on in ancient Israel at the time of its opening. But it adds something very important. It clearly testifies that Christ was a much bigger part of events in the Old Testament than secular scholars realize. And that's on the, that's on the scholarship point. And on the theology point, I've already talked about it. it, it uh, what, what, what it does is it links us back to that older theology where there is a corporeal father, there is a corporeal mother. We are of a kind with them. And this is the most profound and distinctive uh, thing about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And if we're right on that, there is a really important respect in which we are the one, uh, the one true church in the thing that matters most. Who is God? What is his relationship to us? And who are we? Right? That's, that's a, those are really important points. So, and that's really where I wanted to go with this. I asked Rosalind this question, and I want to ask you, um, because the biggest criticism of the Book of Mormon for Protestants and, you know, Catholics and whatever— is that there's way too much Christology in the Book of Mormon, especially the Old Testament period. Right. And so they're saying, well, that's just showing Joseph's biases. That's a 19th century theology. Uh, so how do you respond to that? Well, our, our uh, counterclaim is that uh, the Deuteronomists took took the corporeal God out of the scriptures. And, and the secular scholars actually agree with us on this point. I, I mean, the argument I'm making is that, um, actually, the theology we're defending is the Abraham theology. And that's what the scholarship would tell us. So, so like, if you go to um, the Catholics and start uh, confronting them with this older theology, it's problematic for them. They have to say something like this. They have to say that, um, well... 
understanding evolved across time toward the truth. So, so in the earlier period, the Abraham and the people of that time had a faulty understanding. And but it, things kind we of— We didn't get it until Christ was born, basically. Well, well, no, they would be saying— uh, it, but that understanding dramatically improved when Josiah came along. Oh. Josiah's Deuteronomist revolution was was what made finally got God right. So okay. so so they had God wrong until so that Josiah moment. Josiah is a saint, not a sinner for them. Well, 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 more of a well he is for, for the Bible, right? For the for, <laughs> for the. I mean, this is uh, it, somebody has to be willing to read the Bible against the grain, at least on the Josiah story. Josiah is the great hero in the in the in the Deuteronomist Bible, right? But he's not the great hero in the Book of Mormon. Right. If you read the Book of Mormon, Lehi well, is not really going on. Mention Josiah by name, at least. No, but but he was a contemporary of Lehi. Right. I, I mean, uh, he was king when Lehi was. Uh, uh, all the Lehi's sons were being born, and all this stuff was happening at the time of Lehi, and and Lehi had to get out because he didn't like Josiah. Uh, well, Josiah died, but uh, Josiah's theology was taking. Uh, Le Lehi says he had to leave because he was teaching that there was a God with God. There was a Messiah. And the people were going to kill him because he was teaching that there was this other God with God, the Son, the Messiah. So, and that's uh, that's exactly what Josiah was doing: was throwing out of the temple all the son, the sons. Uh, I mean, they had tokens all the of sons of God. Yeah, they had Moloch. To yeah, and Baal. Well, well, I don't know about the no with Baal. We don't like Moloch, but Baal for sure. Well, Baal, uh, their their name for Baal was uh, Yava. Yava and Baal were alternative names for the same being, probably. Yeah. In other words, in the in the Canaanite theology next to them, they were calling this being Baal, this son of El Baal, and in the Hebrew in Israel they were calling him Yava. And you can see how you start to get a fight then, right? What's the right name? And you guys are believing in the wrong one. Well, uh, and we're, and and back and forth. So, well, and it goes actually, that's... we have the same thing with the Protestants, right? Uh, who has the true Jesus? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> But it kind of goes to that, where's that story where the the prophet called down lightning and he got it all wet? Yeah. Uh, because it was like, well, who's the real God? Right. And Yahweh was the correct God, but he was going against Baal, wasn't he? Right. Yeah, that was against the priest of Baal. But, you know, in that story, uh, the people who um, who read like uh, Margaret does— they they are because it also mentions and over on the side were a few of the priests of uh, priests of Asherah. See, it's, yeah. it, it's it's in that story. It's uh, is it Elijah that did this? I'm trying to you know I I, I can't. It's so I feel bad that I can't remember. That yeah, either. we're, we're uh, this is embarrassing, but <laughs> uh, but but um, but I I, know, I remember from the story that uh, that. Um, the Ash the Asherah priests are over on the side, and and it's like they're kind of added in. They weren't part of the in initial story. So someone like Margaret would read that and say, uh, yeah, there was real enmity toward Baal, but it, but they went and revised after the Deuteronomist reforms and tossed in the Asherah folks because it didn't have that kind of enmity toward Asherah uh, running through the Old Testament. Okay. I mean, there there's places where it's there, but it, it's not the same way as with Baal and you can make the you could you can make the argument and I think Margaret does pretty consistently that the Asherah stuff is a distortion like Josiah and post Josiah distortion of the text and she finds places where she can see the Hebrew being corrupted and tell you what the original thing said hmm. that was more complimentary uh, and then they turned it into a condemnation instead of a, of a compliment. So, um, and I don't have the kind of Hebrew to dig into that, but. Uh, okay. Uh, I'll have to see if I can get her. Where does she live? She's in England, so oh. <laughs> Southwest won't get you there. I guess I'll have to do a Zoom <laughs> on that one, but all right. But she comes over here once in a while. I don't know if she, I mean, she, she's been over here to the Temple Studies group things. She's, she's got more devoted followers here in Utah than she has in England, oh, probably. <laughs> I'll have to track down her schedule somehow. Wonder if she's coming to Maxwell Institute, any idea? Yeah, I don't, I don't know what they do. I, I'm not in the club again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, is there anything we need to, to finish up on this? Well, just thanks for the great work you do of getting all these different perspectives and views and voices of the restoration out. You know, a, a, 
really rich work has been done. I didn't appreciate it as much as I do now until I joined that Book of Mormon Perspectives uh, Monday night meeting, which yeah. other people are invited to. It's open to anybody who wants to come. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people from various restoration traditions who love the Book of Mormon and love God, and, who, and you start to see... Uh, my insularity was certainly exploded to some extent, and yeah. and you go around exploding insularity all over the place. So. <laughs> <laughs> You're a big bomb in the middle of insularity. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bill Shepard's there all the time. Yeah, he is. He he's is a definitely. So. He's there essentially every time. Yeah. So a Strangite representative and great guy, uh, wonderful guy. I go when they're not jazz games on Monday night. <laughs> 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 so. All right. Well, any so remind us what you're working on in the future so people can keep it. The thing on. I'm working on right now is a, a theory of the atonement. So it's okay. it's looking at um, this, this. Not only do we have a distinctive theory about who God is uh, that separates us out from everybody else, and if we're wrong, we're we're way wrong, and if if we're right, everybody else is way wrong mm. on this on this single most important issue, right, of who God is, but. Uh, it, there's uh, the the idea of who God is has huge implications for how the atonement works, and we talked a little bit about the atonement last time, and uh, all these other these various theories that don't work. But basically, none of the theories really work with a God who creates uh, everything out of nothing, because it's God creating all the evil, and then atoning for all the evil and requiring himself to atone for all the evil. And it, it's, uh, there's just a ton of confusion and contradiction built into that, the various theories. But uh, in, the, in our theology, the problem of evil essentially disappears. Um, the atonement is put in a completely different frame because God is, uh, is not outside of space and time, the creator of everything, God exists in a set of pre-existing circumstances. And he's dealing with those pre-existing circumstances. And we are part of those pre-existing circumstances. He didn't create us in our essence. Okay. The in intelligence is run created. Well, all kinds of interesting things follow from that theological shift. And, and what I do is, uh, uh, working with Noel there, I work out, uh, the theology of that, and I'm, and it's not penal substitution, Christus Victor, satisfaction. What are the others? I well, it, it the thing that gets closest to is moral influence. Okay, and we talked about that a little bit in the in the previous yeah. interview, but it's it's not just that. I, I I haven't come up with a new name for it. And if I was if I was a better Terrible marketer, Givens. a better practical marketer, I'd come up with a really good uh, brand name for it because it's distinctive enough that it, it needs a brand name to really catch hold. Terrell Givens talked about consequential something. I can't remember how that Terrell was. understands this theology. He, he understands the distinctiveness of this theology very well. And he says a lot of things that are totally in harmony with what I'll be talking about. I, 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 if Terrell reads this paper, he, he... He doesn't read anything. Yeah. Unless he has to. You're right. But <laughs> if, if he were to read this paper, he would, uh, he would recognize pretty much all the claims that are made there. The thing that he would maybe uh, not, it would just be uh, the specific interpretations of passages of scripture. And it's a different way of anchoring it too. I mean, I, I, I th I'm, I'm making a little bit of advance in the details, but the, the fundamentals, he understands how much important it is that God is not outside of time and is not the creator of all time. That, that has huge theological implications. Terrell fully knows that. Okay. So this paper's coming out. Do you have any idea? Well, uh, I've, I, I've, I have, forever. it has two parts to it. The first part about sin and death and the second part about uh, justice and basically justice and the second part about mercy. I'm just about done with the justice half of it. I haven't started the mercy half yet. And, and it will be a year out. Yeah, definitely. Well, yeah. By the time it gets published, probably. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anything else? Um, well, I just had a paper. I've got a paper coming out, which is looking at uh, Moroni uh, and the the five endings that Moroni composed for the Book of Mormon. I talked about one of the the how uh, his last ending he got from uh, from reading the the, uh, the last writer in the small plates uh, that came out of that paper. But it, it it's just astonishing 
to, to watch uh, Moroni mature as a person and as a writer as he writes five sub, uh, sequential endings for the Book of Mormon over a period of many years. Like its first ending, he's just a, it, he's writing it in the immediate aftermath of, uh, of uh, the, the destruction of the battle. And it's it's very short. It's like five verses, and he's he's just saying, you know, I'm I'm barely surviving here. My dad told me to write something. That here it is. He's told you uh, anyway. And and then uh, and then he and then he. It's next ending. He just dumps on us. He he missed the Dale Carnegie course uh, on uh, how to win <laughs> friends and influence people because he just dumps on us moderns. We you, you people are so worthless and wicked. And and then and he's he rhetorically really ineffective. And I show that uh, in that uh, that ending, and and it, it just gets better with each subsequent ending. He gets more and more powerful, and by the time he gets to that, uh, all of his faults as a writer. Are dropping away by the time he gets to that last ending that we we all know and love, and I and I kind of show how uh, how he matures across time, and he says in there, uh, you put yourself in danger of hell, hellfire if you focus on my weaknesses as a writer, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, but the argument I make is his weakness is actually a strength in that it. This feeds into the historicity of the Book of Mormon because you're seeing a guy. I mean, this, the kind of genius it would take to to show uh, when you're writing Moroni across time to show him changing and growing as a person in his in his view of us, the moderns, and in his rhetorical effectiveness is. I mean, it's just astonishing uh, level of. Uh, literary sophistication, if that were put in uh, by Joseph Smith because he was such a, a literary genius. So uh, Terrell Givens, or not not Givens, but uh, Grant Hardy does a great job of framing this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, he's he's one of my favorite uh, Book of Mormon commentators, and I think understanding Book of Mormon. Have you, have you interviewed him? I have not. That, he, I've asked him, and I think he said no, if I remember. Uh, oh, okay. Well, okay. But understanding the Book of Mormon, I think, is the best thing done on the Book of Mormon in, in this century, and and it's among the best things ever done on it. And what he does is he brackets the question of historicity, but then he goes and shows how sophisticated the Book of Mormon is as a, as a work of literature. And I'm, in a sense, building on what Terrell does as I show how... Um, how Moroni grows across time in those interviews or in those uh, endings he writes. And it's just, so, so if you want to be the, have a secular account, uh, if you, what, what uh, Grant does is he puts you in this position. You can say that Joseph wrote it because he brackets the question of historicity, but you, you have to attribute as, as we read the text, the way the Jews do and see more and more depth in it, you have to, uh, constantly attribute ever greater literary genius to Joseph, you know, and how plausible is that at the end of the day? So, so then we, then we either get Joseph, the towering literary genius or the farm boy translator of, of revelations from God, you know, take your pick. And, and the Lord doesn't force us on this. I mean, you can make a case for both. I mean, um, you can make, uh, if people, we have to choose the world we want to live in. We can live in the world of where God does uh, exists, reveals, and and is involved in our lives and everybody else's lives, uh, or we can uh, choose to live in a world where He doesn't exist, and we get and the and we'll get the we'll live in the world whichever world we choose, and and there's enough evidence to let you choose either one of them. So uh, it makes this earth a good test of our preferences. That's another thing Terrell Givens is really good on. He understands. The plan of salvation is God's going to let us all get the thing that we choose, that we want. And uh, if we want to have a secular type uh, existence without Christ and the atonement, we can have that. And we can have it through the eternities and that some people are going to prefer it. Satan and his bunch, prefer, they had a, Satan actually is, uh, I, I talk about this in the atonement paper, say, uh, God is a realist, so he's totally anchored in reality, a, a reality outside himself. Satan is uh, a romantic, a fantasist. And and the the English romantics, I'm talking about um, like uh, Shelley and, and Byron, they really admired Satan in Milton, Milton's Satan. 
and they aspired to be like Satan, uh, 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 creators of their own realities. Uh, that's the romanticism. I'm not bound by existing reality. I create my own realities. And Satan lives in his own created reality, but but it, reality does exist. You know, this is so. It, when we start creating our realities, look, this is a critique of the church. Uh, the, uh, the way the 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 the, the church's critique of existing culture. You can you can make yourself anything you want to, right? The libertarian, uh, liberal libertarian uh, woke uh, idea now is we can make ourselves anything we want to be. I, I can make my body whatever it is. I can make my sex, my gender. All this stuff is completely mutable, and uh, that's uh, in my my atonement argument. I I'm saying that is a species of uh, one of the things I say in this paper is Satan gets us to believe in this world in his gospel in his pre mortal plan rather than the um, God's plan. Hmm. it's showing up in, in the evolution of our culture, which uh, gets rid of reality and lets you create your own realities. It's, it's there in the theology, the theology of Orthodox, uh, of Orthodox Christianity, uh, the God outside of space and time, unconstrained by anything else. That was the God that Satan conceived himself to be. And so the Satan's plan in the uh, preexistence has a lot in common with say Calvin's uh, theology and Luther's theology, so I, I'll get into that in the in the atonement paper. Cool, looking forward to it. You going to bombs in the fall? Yeah, uh, cool. I hope to go to it every every year, and I'll, and we'll be back next summer. Uh, okay, every summer's here and every uh, Christmas. Okay. Well, great. Well, Dr. Val Larson from James Madison University. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here on Gospel Tangents. Well, thanks for the work you do again. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Val Larson. Val, thank you so much for sitting down with me. It was super fun, as always, and uh, looking forward to seeing you again in the fall. Bombs up in Logan. In our next conversation, I'm excited to talk to Mary Jane Woodger. She's the author of Mission President or Spy. This is a book about uh, Wallace Toronto. He was the mission president in Czechoslovakia. He is amazing. I'm sure that he served longer as a mission president than any other mission president we've ever had. Yeah. And as you said, he covered the pre-Nazi um, regime in Czechoslovakia and then was there after the communists took over also. Right. So, And then he was the de facto mission president. He came home to Utah after he was escorted out of the countries. Thanks for listening, and I hope you to continue to enjoy Gospel Tangents. Consider becoming a Patreon or go to gospeltangents.com slash shop, and you can get a cool tie, a hat, or even a nice mug. You can also get a sweatshirt, so check it out at gospeltangents.com slash shop.